one. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Inside Movies Galore. At this late hour, we are going to be going on about, about a very, very dark, but melodic and romantic fi uh, uh, film <laughs> um, called a Vampire Hunter D. It is an animation <laughs> from 1985, and it is directed by, uh, uh, by Toyu Ashida, if I am correct in uh, in saying his name um and uh what, just, what, what name did you put out toyu ashida <laughs> okay a and n list the director is yoshiaki kawaziri but i'm trying to remember yeah whatever um there's that, a lot of writer uh, that is the writer uh, wait no uh, yasuji hirano screenplay this, this is what uh, IMDb says. Uh, it is Toyo Ashida. Okay, I was looking at. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I <laughs> goofed. I was looking at Bloodlust. <laughs> A different uh, movie. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, whatever. That's so great. Yeah, which I did. yeah, yeah cool. Toyo Ashida and Yasushi Hirano. Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, so uh, I'm just gonna say what IMDb says about the film um uh, b uh, before we go into the first impressions um a young girl requests the help of a vampire hunter to kill the vampire who has bitten her and thus prevent her from becoming a vampire herself so um first impressions uh, uh starting with uh you brandon why don't you tell us a little, uh, 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 a little bit about when you were first introduced to this film was this your first time oh no no uh uh though i oddly enough i did not put this one up uh though uh it, it got overwhelmingly voted in a matter of fact uh a close second place um i was first introduced to this film during my early days watching anime um on the sci-fi channel okay because sci-fi I would have, and Dave, I know you're familiar with this as well. Yes. They would have their block of anime, and they introduced me to a few things. Lily Cat, uh, yep. SOS Earth, uh, let's see here, uh, Robot Carnival, Project Aco, all of these, and many of them are kind of not super famous, many of them, except see, Project Aco. I, <laughs> but I, I, I myself uh, got into Akira and Lily Cat through that. So, and Vampire Hunter D was one of those staples of '80s anime that came out of it, and it was just really cool. It was one of those that I considered a gem of a movie when I watched it. <laughs> it was so gothic and real. It just uh, made me feel much, uh, what's the word? Uh, it just made me feel uh, enlightened as to what anime could be. <laughs> so I'll admit, it was very different from the scarring I got from Lily Cat when I first saw that. <laughs> so I got some scarring from Lily Cat at the time, and I could not remember it for the life of me until you finally came up with the title of it. So. Um, <laughs> I've never upgraded to the Blu-ray of this because I got the DVD. It's one of my early DVDs in the early 2000s at a Sam Goody. Oh, now, God. gosh, if y'all remember that, that's a, that is a piece of, coll of uh, movie collector history right there. Yes. And uh, it was just, uh, to me, it was a great memory seeing it there, watching as it first came out on, on DVD there. It was just uh, to be seen. So uh, it was great rewatching it and revisiting it. I was uh, quite pleased that we had that opportunity to check Indeed. this out. So very good, very cool sci-fi fantasy uh, anime there. Okay. Going over to you, Mo. Um, what was your first imp impression of this film? And was this the first time watch for you? Oh, no, definitely. And very similar <laughs> boat to Brandon. Vampire Hunter D is kind of one of those classic 80s sort of 
retro anime that you see when you first really start digging through anime as an actual thing and you've moved beyond seeing whatever the hell they're showing on your local cable network or whatever. Um, I did not buy a DVD at Sam Goody, so I was stuck with straight boots of this for years. Still, the only way that I have it is like a duped VHS tape. And they were always dark as shit, Mm -hmm. which... Honestly, watching it on this upload that Brandon put for us was amazing because it's the clearest that I've ever seen Vampire Hunter D. But it loses a little bit of that gothicness, I think. You know, it used to. This movie looked like how a Cradle of Filth album sounds, you know. Uh, I even wore my shirt tonight just because of that shit, you know. Like, it, 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 you, on VHS, like a shitty dupe of a VHS of Vampire Hunter D, I think is still one of the best ways to see it you know there's moments where you think your tv broke because it's so dark but the other moments look awesome like some type of crazy music video uh it's you know one of those movies that definitely shows the the sort of staple mutants and gore of like 80s anime seemed like there was a lot of that going on back then and uh, i mean it's just it's hard not to love it a little bit um it's 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 definitely one that I've seen many times over the years. I, I've kind of gravitated, like I think most fans have, towards Bloodlust because it's just a better movie in terms of visual spectacle. Oh, yeah. But this is still a classic. It's right there with like a Saga, Wicked City, Akira. You know, I, I hold it up in that on that same pedestal of being just classic anime. So, I that's where I, it started. I, I <laughs> Um, uh, I myself, uh, so, though I had heard of it, I'd collected it, uh, and I've had it, I've had at least the first one, uh, for many years. I just hadn't pulled it out to watch it. Um, and I, I pulled it out to watch it for this moment. Uh, so, um, actually having to watch the first one, and I think I collected the second one like much uh, much later but i i had both in my collection i just hadn't popped them in um uh my fiance is not much of an an uh, uh, japanese animation cart uh, uh, i mean she'll watch the classic cartoons but anything else it's hard to get her to budge on anything and half the time we're watching everything with each other so uh, so <laughs> to get a chance to watch japanese animation that i'm interested in is <laughs> kind of hard to do but i watched it and i enjoyed it um i liked the gothic uh, feel of it I, although i do have to say the cyborg horse does look kind of like wide as a cow um compared to the uh, the um sequel where he's like thinner and sleeker and uh, I, I don't know uh, uh but I get the sense of uh, that. Uh, see, as I, I know, we can talk about the music later, but the music kind of reminded me of Castlevania. Uh, um, a lot and, of it does. Yeah, like the, there's, you know, I almost I've ne- I didn't bother to check before we <laughs> we started this. Probably should have. I don't know if this predated the the first Castlevania game, but there's some back and forth between the two for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that's the kind of vibe that I was kind of get, uh, get, uh, getting as far as Vampire uh, Hunter uh, D. And I, I fairly enjoyed watching both both films back to ba- back. Although, be it as it may, the, the second film is actually longer than this first endeavor. Um, what about you, Jake? Um, what was your experience with this film? Was this the first time watched for you? It was not a first time. I'm pretty sure this was the second time. And as I unfortunately illustrated at the top of the movie, uh, show, whatever. Even I have trouble uh, sometimes remembering which one came, which one this one was and which one's bloodlust. I'm too sporadically familiar with each one to really you know (laughs) but uh i thought i had this one but apparently i only have bloodlust in the collection but uh it's it's one that i again i think this was my second viewing i could not tell you what language i saw it in the first time but i know brandon posted the streamlined dub this time so that was what i watched and 
it was a perfectly serviceable dub. Um, it works. You it's know, that for, charm. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. yeah, that sort of 80s a- uh, action anime camp. Like, this one basically screamed 80s action anime. <laughs> and I mean that in not, uh, not a good way or a bad way, just kind of a in a way. Uh, it's, in a um, good way. <laughs> yeah, I mean that in a good way. No, uh, it's an interesting movie. It's I could see this being a really good gateway for people that like kind of dark, kind of horror tinged and are open to animation. Uh, for a more established anime fan, it's kind of like, is that all? (laughs) It's kind of, that might be jadedness from like exposure though, you know, a little bit, but it's like a a good example from that time period. And I'm just going to bring this up because I like to give people a shout out when they need it. When I looked up anime news network, which is my source for anime info, the headline here is that Izumi, Izumi Matsumoto, the creator of Kimigori Orange Road, has apparently passed away. So I wanted to give them a shout out because that was a oh, phenomenal man. series. But that I was, was a just good about e- to start that manga too. It's I've never read it, but I've seen the show, and I can't wait to watch my copy of the Both show. Just but the other day. But it's uh, it, but that was from the same time period, and that's a good example of something I came to later as an established fan, and I still was like, holy crap, that's a good show. <laughs> but, um, you know, but the Vampire Hunter D, I'm not going to detract from it too much. It's a good movie. Uh, I don't think I'll have near as much to say on this as I intended to for our previous movie. Um, I'll probably have time enough to say about the same amount, but, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, let's look at the uh, uh, plot line for uh, first, okay. and then we'll get into characters. Um, uh, so we have this um, young girl um, who is apparently <laughs> from a village nearby, and she is running, um, obviously fr- uh, from something or someone, and uh, you. Y- y- you see it from the first person point of view to, uh, too, because she's you just see the blades of gla- uh, grass as she's going through, you know, and uh, um, she ends up uh, uh, confronting and uh, being face to face with uh, the antagonist of the uh, the, uh, the film, which is this humongous um, uh, Dracula looking. Uh, gray-haired ca- uh, character by the name of Magnus Lee, if I remember mm-hmm. correctly. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's got a castle uh, somewhere off in the di- uh, 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 distance, and I'm not exactly sure what the uh, the name of the land is, but uh, he ends up fighting her. And she, uh, she ends up somewhere along the, uh, 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 the way running into this uh, rider on horseback, uh, uh, back, dressed in black, and, and uh, 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 she she's like, "Are you a vampire hunter? You got to be a vampire hunter, you know." And <laughs> that's pretty much the introduction to our our uh, uh, main hero, um, uh, which it, he is kind of a hero uh, in a sense, but he doesn't say it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically, she's bitten by this old count, and she's trying mm-hmm. to hire a vampire hunter to do, you know, the deed, like, destroy mm-hmm. the dude that bit her so that her curse can be broken, and just in general, because he sucks. Um, oh, yes, and, it does. You know, D, she basically just attacks him yeah. right away to test whether or not he's a pussy, because I guess <laughs> previous vampire hunters have been kind of lame. She's a weird combination of tropes. I mean, she is because she has that damsel in distress written all over her, but she's also a badass too, which is kind of cool. I like that uh, combination. Oh, for well, sure. I mean, it opens up with her blowing away mutants and still, and then her horse getting killed. Mm-hmm. Well, Luke. Um, <laughs> but if we get back to the uh, village. Um, uh, obviously she's got a little brother, um, who lives in the village as well. And, uh, when, when they get to the village ce- uh, center, 
uh, there is another protagonist that we meet, which is this pompous, uh, lily pad looking douchebag of a, 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 a who, a, who kind of seems like he's a dandelion because he's dressed all in. And this is the thing. Uh, the character uh, characters of nobility uh, mm -hmm. would dress in a royal garb, and he's dressed in like the royal garb, and he's the mayor's son, and he he, he wants to court this, uh, and it's Doris. That's her name. Uh, Dor Did anyone know? I actually, I actually thought Doris what is an ugly name. Yeah, um, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it totally is. It, I mean, I could not for the life of me understand why someone so cute could be <laughs> named mm -hmm. something so ugly. Like, I, I would name a pig Doris, you know. <laughs> then you, uh, would or, really, you would really be creeped out by the movie, Hello, My Name is Doris. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was a messed up movie. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> looking at that frou frou dude, did anyone else look at that jawline? Did anyone else think, oh, this guy's a, f uh, a fluffy dub version of Beavis? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> 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 uh, that <laughs> obsession with no, yes. the, the whole obsession with nobility thing, though, yeah. is like heavy in this movie, too. So that kind of yeah. actually weirdly fits with American Psycho, which it was does. previous to. Oh, I suppose you could say say that he's the um, oh, what is that character from Sleepy Hollow? Um, uh, the the thin guy, the, the thin Ichabod, oh, Ichabod? Ichabod? Uh, like Ichabod Crane and uh, Beavis had a love child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, in, in any case, that's what uh, and that's what I kind of thought of this dude. Uh, uh, but he he shows up several times throughout the film as well uh, as as a somewhat protagonist because in, in a sense he's in his character he's he's obviously got an obsession with her and he it, it, it mainly because he wants you know she's the only I I actually don't see any other women except for her um per se in the village uh, except for what uh, maybe in the crowd for very minusculely a, a few seconds y you know what i mean well you hear one every time her brother opens his mouth uh that's true <laughs> but <laughs> in any case yeah. um, as the story progresses um, it's, it's your basic damsel in this, uh, a, a stress. Okay. I got to go kill the bad, uh, bad guy. Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, uh, there's some monsters along the way, uh, way including uh, uh, some vampires to, uh, to, uh, to either kill or be killed kind mm -hmm. of a situation. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the short and skinny of it is this count like wants her to be his new bride because he enjoys like getting jiggy with a female girl every so often. <laughs> so he's trying to indoctrinate her into the vampire family after having bitter. And, you know, there's mm -hmm. this, the whole subplot of how like his daughter or whatever that girl is to him doesn't want this commoner chick being like indoctrinated into the family because mm -hmm. she's not nobility. Yeah. Uh, she hires D to take care of this dude, basically to rid the village of this issue and also break her curse. And then there's the subplot of that, you know, dandelion dude, like just being creepy and annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the count is uh, is insistent on sending his. Uh, two droogs out, and one of them ends up being his uh, his daughter, um, and uh, the other ends up being this human who is not quite a vampire, but has been doing the vampire bidding for like many many years. And for some reason, I actually kind of like that guy. Like he's 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 kind of like in the middle because oh, he's, Ray. Yeah, Ray is kind of like your conundrum. He, he's got this badass stem about him that he, he he's 
willing to do anything kamikaze for uh, for, uh, for his respect and nobility that he will earn. You know, basically, yeah, like he wants the count to put him in the family too, so he can be nobility. Mm-hmm. You know, that that human that that's been bitten many many years ago and just has that obsessive love of a, a, a love of a vampire. So. <laughs> Oh yeah, most definitely. It's uh, it, it's kind of cool to see the uh, to see the dynamics that play out. You can see that there's more to the vampiric nature than just animals, even though they can be presented as such throughout mm-hmm. this as well. And we learn that uh, that there are you know the vampires uh, and the humans, but uh, um, the thing that we learned that vampire D is is a vampiro. Which is apparently mm-hmm. half vampire and yeah. half human, uh, but Tom he's got is. this. He's got this amulet uh, that's around him that I think is kind of what helps his apparently hand that speaks. <laughs> yep. What yes. is the uh, uh, thing? Can anyone else describe it to me? Uh, it seems he's got a voice along with him that uh, that speaks to him, and we find out that it is right. a face on a hand of his. I think it's I mean, more of an like enchanted that. thing. Go ahead. No, go ahead, bud. Yeah. I was gonna say you might have more to it than I. I was just gonna say it's probably just an enchanted hand. I did like that the English voice actor was the same <laughs> guy who played Friar Tuck in uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and Bloodlust. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as far as the the whole face hand thing goes, I feel like I've seen that show up in other stories where someone gets like a face or an eye in their hand mm-hmm. and it talks to them. So it's definitely not something that's unique entirely to yeah. Vampire Hunter D. I can't recall where else I've seen that though. But it's basically yeah, it's just this uh, you know something has taken possession of his hand. Yeah. I I feel like it's one of those things that if there is indeed a manga for this, which there probably mm-hmm. is. Uh, it might be made more explicitly clear in that. Uh, I always a... just sort of chalked it up to that his hand got possessed by something along the way when he was doing his thing, like some Ash, you know, Evil Dead type okay. stuff. Okay, but... Mo, the way you just worded that, unfortunately, I hit very close with the dirty thought that I had, which is <laughs> the whole unfortunately. idea. Unfortunately, oh, on that's. that's... <laughs> Well, the whole idea of, like, um, you know, I'm sure there are people out there that would probably say that Mm -hmm. if you do certain activities, your hand will become possessed. (laughs) Yeah, grow some fur on it, you know. (laughs) Yeah, actually, you could see this hand having a nice little mustache. (laughs) (laughs) But But I feel like the hand has its own personality. Yeah. Um, Which, again... When you watch Bloodlust, that comes across a lot more clearly. It's more of a sarcastic nature in, in this one. Now, I, I love the way that... they play it off, too, in this one at first. Like, you think it might be the sword the first time that you watch it. I definitely <laughs> remember thinking, like, oh, dude, this guy's got it. Because he the first scene where the hand really talks is when he takes his sword and he's, like, looking at it, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, and yeah. so definitely the first time I saw it, I thought that it was a talking sword, which, right. again, I've seen in something else. Well, Possibly we've seen, it. We've seen it in our lovely game with uh, with uh, James and his uh, sword, Bob. And <laughs> 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 but the um, now, Brand, I had assumed this was the streamlined dub, but that was what you put up, or did you put up the Sentai dub? Uh, this is the original dub. Oh, so, so the streamlined, okay? Because yeah, Sentai and probably would have been I a little. I think I watched the original dub too yeah. because my uh, my copy isn't through yeah. Sentai. Um, so, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, it's the dub that I remember. So, and mm-hmm. that's coming from like VHS tapes. So, unless I'm just okay. making that up in my head, and it just seems familiar, it's the one. So you got, was... <clears throat> so you got Michael McConaughey as D and his hand, mm-hmm. Jeff Linkless as Magnus Lee, Barbara Goodson as Doris Lang, Kerrigan Mahan as Ray. Yeah, Lamika, I guess, is the daughter, Lee's daughter. Yeah. So that was yeah. Edie Merman. Yeah. And then so was the, the kid? First... The kid was Dan, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Laura Cody. Yeah. Huh. So um, I don't know why, but I, I, I always pictured Dan from the Rebel Gaming Club. That's a yeah. That's <laughs> I was thinking that the whole there. time. I was like, like a little Dan right there. Yeah. I'm sure. I could see him rocking some shoulder pads like that, too. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what he, maybe he should go for that as Halloween, right? Well, and uh, in the village, the uh, the villagers, uh, they uh, they actually want to put her in some concentration camp uh, uh, instead, um, uh, uh, which apparently uh, they've done that before because the scientist that was there, uh, there which he comes up later on, too um but um the scientist that was uh, there he ca- came and sided with the, uh, them and said hey i know that that pl- uh, place is not like cool uh so uh mm-hmm. let's not do that <laughs> you know yeah last time yeah. they did it the count out of revenge like killed 31 villagers or something uh, yeah for putting one of the yeah, subjects like pretty yeah. much so um Regardless, uh, they uh, they go on this pilgrimage to uh, to uh, basically confront the Magnus uh, 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 the Magnus Lee, uh, Lee the, uh, the the vampire lineage, or uh, or at least, and uh, the the two protagonists that we come up against against for uh, well, actually for uh, first. Uh, sh- shall we talk about about the confrontation with uh, with the dandelion that, uh, that we see at first, the, the nut kick to the balls? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, okay, this is a funny thing that I thought was entertaining about the du- original dub and censorship on Sci-Fi Channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember this even from back then, that because uh, he when she does that, he goes, "God damn it." And they left damn it in there, but they bleeped out God. Yeah. Which I, at the time, I understand it now more than I did back then, but still, it is funny that they still leave damn it in there when they said it's that. It's just like earlier, uh, uh, before I started wa- watching uh, um, uh, uh, the previous uh, uh, film, uh, it, it, they, they had Gladiator on, on the Sundance channel, and uh, there's this guy that literally kisses his pants right before he goes out into his gladiator ring, and they uh, they uh, they show uh, Russell Crowe backing up, but they don't show him pissing his pants. You know, it's like <laughs> what the so fuck? Stupid. It's stupid. Uh, well, I mean, since we're on the topic, you guys remember like the old Superstation overdubs where they would, oh, like put in a word instead of the the swear word. I wish that so hard that I could find the old Steven Seagal movies with those dubs. <laughs> I'd pay hard money for it. So if any of you guys out there like have access to that, just let me know. Uh, especially for next month, uh, there are a couple of Seagal movies actually up for vote in some of the. Uh some of the polls so that's gonna that would be kind of cool <laughs> i thought about throwing some out man out for justice is a hard classic for me right there but we'll see how it goes <laughs> uh so um as they go on the soldier and they end up meeting up with ray and uh, uh what, what is her uh, uh, the daughter's character uh, again oh i forget her name she's pretty monica. hot though monica only Mommy only God. boobies that we didn't see in the movie too. Mommy when I think about it. Okay, <clears throat> let me go or whatever. If I remember uh, right so- too, they abduct Doris or whatever the hell. Yeah, like she gets abducted. That's why he's actually going to the castle. He was going to go there anyways because he was going to kill the dude. But they very much video game structure it for like the the center chunk of the movie. Right. You know, she gets kidnapped. He has to fight a couple of boss fights along the way. Uh, yeah, and, and eventually and, uh, you know, storms Ray, the castle and grabs her. Ray's an interesting character because he's got these uh, boomerangs uh, th- th- that are white and they flash and, and shit like that. And supposedly Italy, Italy, they ha- uh, hold some kind of magical powers or, or what whatnot. Uh, th- 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 that I think it's more he does too because he can bend space and time or like you know around him so right. that like there's that part where d oh, yeah, tries yeah. to stab him and then he ends up stabbing himself because he like reverses it or whatever they mm-hmm. kind of forget about it though later on so 
Yep. He's and a really uh, powerful character. And vampire. I I like that first confrontation because that's when we get to see some of vampire D's like full capacity power. You know, uh, he's not quite. Uh, showing the power that he sh- uh, shows when he's up against Magnus Lee, but you show uh, he, he, he his eyes turn blue and it, it, you know things around him um, seem to shape a little differently, you know, and um, you get the immense power that that he has when he's turning into a vampire, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. uh, now. A, a good comparison on those two is, um, gosh, what's his name? Is Alucard in Helsing, oh, yeah. which we were going to do this month, but we decided to uh, work on the Friday 13th project. And uh, because, well, you find out the end, uh, D's lineage and what the D really stands for. Uh, so it's very similar in a lot of ways. And he, they also I'd both like to, wear stupid hats. You know? Actually, it'd be kind of cool to see a, a fight between Alucard and D. I think Alucard oh, would be beat epic. him, but uh, I, but you I don't really know. don't see the extent see, of D's power. If you wrote it right, I think it would be a draw, or D would win because Alucard seems the obvious one. So if I was going into it to do it. I think I would write it where it was like insane, but then they had basically like a draw or D ended up winning somehow. Uh, but what? it would be interesting for sure. <laughs> yeah, get on the internet. Uh, but do you mean, I don't know. If I feel like Vampire Hunter D is definitely the origin of exaggeratedly kind of silly hats for vampire characters. <laughs> <laughs> it just does happen. It is like a thing. <laughs> And oh, he's got a cool it's, it's 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 a thing in the same way as Japanese kids hanging out on the roof of their school in anime. You know, it's like it's there. It's yeah, he's he's kind of got a Zoro looking hat. Uh, as far as anything is concerned, uh, he's is pretty hat. cool. You know, and for I, comparing like, hats, I did I did uh, notice that Doris had a whip. Yeah, yep. A little Castlevania oh, there for I, you. I, 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 I liked think. that about her. For some reason she got that electro whip and uh she actually <laughs> knows how to use it it's yeah much tougher than than your traditional like uh damsel in distress i mean her father was a it was a werewolf hunter who yeah. uh unfortunately didn't know how to handle vampires <laughs> so that kind of screwed that's, him. yeah that's something i and take a little bit of issue is. with like how the hell are you a werewolf hunter and you haven't killed some vampires too or like, at least no, I have well of killing this... a vampire this seems to follow the idea that werewolves, uh, that vampires could wipe the floor with werewolves, you know. Depends on which, which most way you things look at. do. Yeah. Something else I take issue with, but, you know, that's a, que- that's a discussion for another time. Well, if you want with the Rosario vampire uh, world, in the Rosario vampire, they do put werewolves on more stake than vampires, uh, and some of the other ones as well. I don't nice. know. She takes that Rosario off. Mm-hmm. See, I'm only ten chapters in, so I barely just saw her like fight her first couple of bad guys. But Isn't the definitely. werewolf the guy that runs the newspaper? Yeah, and he ends yeah. up like I say, she can she shows like a vampire is like way on the vampire in that universe is top tier monster, it's the most powerful. So it's kind of like um so it is the the uh creature of all might. So I think that's how they look at it uh, here. Is that vampires? Yeah, like the I misunderstood what you were saying. Then I was hoping that it was going to be that werewolves were like better because I just like them more. But I, I suppose in the grand scheme of things, it makes sense when they have like the vampires as the, the almighty sort of creatures because they are immortal, you know, and pretty mm-hmm. much indestructible unless you pierce their heart, which is that's surprisingly that. easy. And Dave, you had ta- touched on the hell, uh, like concentration camp, and they were thinking about that just because, uh, well, she's been bitten, so she's infected. So they're worried that she, she could just be like um, a plague. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, they're, they're thinking she's going to go vamp and like, uh, and just end up uh, 
going off and start biting everybody, you know? No, um, <laughs> just been there's shades of them trying to like be deeper with it with the whole scene where she's trying to shop at the general <laughs> store and the guy's like, Oh, we're out of stock, and they're like, Yeah, right, it's all right here on the shelves. And then they yeah. talk about how he'd lose all his business. Say, you know, if, we won't tell a vampire, yeah, yeah, and it's like, <laughs> ah, I mean, I don't know, that's not. <laughs> You can't, it's not catching, you know, they have to give it to you. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, she hadn't quite been tur- uh, tur- uh, turned uh, yet, and that is the villagers' misconception about uh, when you are really a vampire and what is, uh, what is the difference between a bite and a turning. So, well, because it's the whole traditionally the thing is that, like, he yes. has to bite you, but then you also have to drink his blood. Yeah. Or whatever I, tradition seems to be. Yeah, there's like a whole second half to it. Just them biting you doesn't make you a vampire. They can drink your although, blood all day. Although, Rosario Vampire is a good example of that, although too. Although in the original Universal Vampire films, of course, uh, once you were bitten you, uh, you and you didn't die, uh, you became a vampire <laughs> or a bevy to the uh, 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 of yeah it's kind of one of those things you know they it, it depends on which version of the lore they're doing yeah. i mean half of the time it's kind of like if you just get bit you're you're a vampire but then the other half of the time it's they gotta like indoctrinate you you know yeah and i think that it's the latter half where they have to indoctrinate yeah. you, you in this uh, this uh, stage which is what, what the ritual of the wedding is supposed to do eventually down the road, which, uh, uh, but um, we have, like you said, a kidnapping happen. And uh, they, he, well, what do we think about the confrontation between the uh, the uh, daughter, Lamika, and uh, Ray? Ends abruptly. You know, like the whole oh, first. Yeah. Like encounter with those guys, it's like the dude they kind of do their thing with the boomerang and and D stabbing himself or whatever, uh, and then the girl gets in the mix and then it just kind of cuts to the next scene, you know. <laughs> uh, and then of course we, uh, we get the kidnapping and, the cu- uh, and uh, there's a couple of scenes at home uh, at the uh, at the the at the home of the uh, the young Doris and her brother and um you get kind of a sense of uh, what kind of a person he is not this first time but the second time they're back at the, uh, at the home. yeah after he rescues her uh, yeah what were you gonna say there brandon no no i was just agreeing <laughs> <laughs> well, that whole sequence where he storms the castle and like he jumps into that drawbridge and it's just like pure <laughs> 80s anime weirdness in there. Have yeah, fun storming that shit the just castle. Kicks ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got you got a little bit of blood and gore in there, some creepy creatures. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Am I wrong in thinking like maybe this is just the you know select 80s anime that I saw, but it felt like like that was definitely the era of weird mutants and creatures and like oh, yeah. gore yeah. and stuff like that oh. like in the in the 80s anime was full of that i feel like yeah or at least a lot of the shit that you uh, saw on home video you know there's actually a history lesson to be had in that if you think about it when it comes to america and localizing anime back in that time right back in the 80s and early 90s a lot of people had this thought like, hey, uh, Americans must <clears throat> like only violence and gory stuff, mm-hmm. obviously, because, you know, that, that that's obviously all we watch uh, is violence and gory stuff. So oh, yeah. a ton of stuff that gets localized here during that time period is the gory stuff. And it even was used to drive some creation of certain anime. I mean, oh, look at Fist sure. of the North Star um, being a good example. Actually, Fist of the North Star is a glowing example of what 80s anime could be. But even yes. things like Lily Cat, like, um, gosh, what's the... 
just tons of these things. Mad Bio Bull, Hunter, uh, fucking six. Ogre Slayer, you know, Ninja Scroll to some extent, Wicked City, like all. It, it felt like they imported based on the shock factor. So oh, back in the day cyber. when I was first getting into <laughs> anime, like when I when I first was like cutting teeth on it, you looked at that manga logo as almost the same way that you looked at the trauma logo. Like you saw it, oh, and you yeah. knew it was like, okay, this is going to be fucked up. I'll probably rent this from Hollywood Video, you know. Um, and this is no exception. It's one of those movies that I def- think firmly fits into that sort of and niche who- of anime. Anyone who is at, in any sense of the word, the word in knowance of, you know, anime, anime has, has at least heard of this film. Um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I didn't get to see it until, uh, until like, yesterday. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> it was, I, I guess I was kind of behind on on some of the classic anime, anime and uh, maybe I, I missed out on some of the mystique of the film, maybe seeing it like on VHS when I was still collecting VHS. But uh, um, uh, and I guess in a sense, I, I feel some loss there uh, not being able uh, able to enjoy some of that. Uh, but um having seen it and knowing of it at least and seeing it for the first time i'm glad i did so um but it's uh, one of those ones where you see it and you can imagine having nostalgia for it you know kind of like something like the games like you see it and you understand why people praise it as being a classic because it definitely is you know uh when you see it, you should also check out Three Times Three Eyes, Dave. I think you'd enjoy that. Um, oh, yeah. It's another classic, oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a gem. Uh, it's All that stuff from back then had that special flavor to it, and I think that's the thing that st- stood out to me the most watching this. And it's best described in that scene where he first comes into the castle. It's just like 80s anime goodness distilled into a little compact fucking handful of, of deliciousness, you know. Uh, <laughs> when you see that shit, it's like every mutant you've ever seen in weird old 80s anime right. in one scene, you know. He, <laughs> it's like a stage in a video game, too, the way he runs through it. Uh, the, the whole center chunk of the movie really is like a video game. And... It kind of builds in the same progression that a video game would, too, where you fight those sub-bosses, and then you fight some other crazy shit, and then you fight the sub-bosses again, and then you fight the main boss, you know? See, that's why I felt like I was getting a Castlevania vibe, a vibe from the, uh, this, and I, I, I almost wonder if yeah. Castlevania got uh, some of the, uh, uh, their uh, inklings sure. of how they, uh, they would do things from this film. They um, had to. I mean, if not in the first game, then in later games for sure. There's there's a similar vibe to a lot of it, you know. So, um, what do we think about Magnus Lee as a character? <laughs> He's just some old dude vampire. I mean, yeah, he's a classic count vampire. I think I did like the fact that he had a cake uh, that 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 Draculish cake, you know, the uh, the uh, that cape that he could bring around his victim and uh, bring the neck much closer. I really like the quality of his dub in this. Like, it had that echoey thing going on with his voice all the time, so every time he talked, it sounded like the intro to a a shabbily made death metal album or something. Uh, No, I... I, I, Oh, go go ahead. Oh, no, I just enjoyed it. I, I thought that the it was interesting when you see him at the beginning uh, where he's just confronting and you're wondering what's going to happen. And uh, later on, you do see just the expression on his face because he's lived for so long yeah. that terrible boredom has constantly been hitting him over and over again. And that, uh, And you can see that like on his face when you move from... The, the time he confronts Doris to the next scene where he's mm. just sitting on his throne yeah. looking like he is just 
totally over everything else going on. I, I like how they uh, they how they got into that and how they mentioned that. And um, there's like one part where like I think where he is going toward his so called wedding. And uh, he and Doris going along, and then Ray decides to confront him and gets his ass handed to him oh, severely. I love that so and then, much. and then he's like, "I want to thank you. I have not been bored once tonight." You know, and it's like, yeah, it's uh, interesting that you know, it's. Yeah, he he definitely. I get that idea. It's like. When you think about, well, what would be something that would be really cool? And I am always without time. I'm always feeling like there's no time. Like I can't do the things I want to do. And I'm thinking like, what would it be like to have a super long life? And on the one yeah. hand, you get to do stuff. But on the other hand, you'd be like, you would get You're bored. stuck. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, that really went through my head a lot this time yeah. watching it. Like what would I do if I was just ever just like bored of fucking humanity or what? I think I'd go like watch rocks grow or something like that, you know, like, and then you eventually get to the point. I think if you're like living this long murderous life of being super powerful where it does make some sense that you'd want to mess with like a protagonist or whatever, just yeah. because they seem like they might be powerful enough to actually interest you again. And this, so it, uh, also, it made me think a lot about like immortal villains like that that I've seen in the past where it's like, why didn't you just like not mess with that dude? Then you'd still be alive. Well, but they were just trying to have a bit of fun, you know? Well, yeah. And, and that brings to mind a couple of uh, like I could easily hear him giving the line that the Archduke gives in Maverick. I kill everything in sight and he's boring me. <laughs> 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 Or oh, even Adam Sandler's Dracula, uh, Dracula right. uh, uh, saying uh, something right. similar. <laughs> well, he was definitely a more uh, kinder, gentler sort of vampire. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just a little. He was friendly oh. at the beginning, uh, but then he yeah. became a little bit more soft-hearted in the end. I don't go right. blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. That's uh, I think that's just how they do it. I mean, with this, I do love the traditional vampires uh, mixed with that and the setting. I thought mm -hmm. this is something interesting about D, and this kind of goes into some of these Japanese fantasy things, is where they set these up as almost a post-apocalyptic world. Yeah, but right. You look at it on the surface, and it appears to be gothic. But you're noticing like all of this mm -hmm. cyborg stuff, not as much in this one, but in the second one. But mm -hmm. you do get to see it in this one some, like in some yeah. on the a couple horse, of things, yeah. uh, specifically, um, uh, in this particular feature, you can see. Yeah. Well, the horse. And there's the part where the drone runs into like the electric fence while she's quarantined or whatever. I mean, there's several points where it's like very subtle future tech thrown in there you know mm -hmm. i think a lot of it is uh, i mean i think of there's there was some sort of nuclear apocalypse but i can't remember entirely the way oh, I think what about anime it. was it i was just watching to where it was like you know i never thought about when this is supposed to take place but it's like there is old stuff that's a common thing actually you Brandon know, definitely hit on a good thing there because a I lot was, of sort of fantasy japanese stuff does have I that was, even Naruto has touches of that. I was thinking along the lines of the Man in Black in the Dark Tower series. Uh, the world that moved with, on. With, uh, with yeah. um, Roland Deschane as uh, be, mm -hmm. be, uh, being the um, uh, uh, the last gunslinger to uh, yeah. go across. Yeah, there's shades too of like the man with no name Clint Eastwood shit in this for sure. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you get a bit of that vibe from D as he's rolling into town, and then she just kind of meets him on the road there. And... Or maybe, What's like, that? a little... Kind of no. the Western vibe. Yeah. 
I was going to say almost, you know, uh, I, you mentioned that, but I was almost thinking as far as Westerns, almost a little bit of a Django vibe too, you know, the little bit of, uh, and as far as the post-apocalyptic, this is kind of a weird out there thought, but like I said, I, there was a lot I could have said on our discussion for American Psycho that I simply didn't get a chance to. Uh, one thing that was mentioned that I thought was interesting was they compared it to heavily to A Clockwork Orange, and I saw it pointed out yeah. that that was like a period piece, whereas Clockwork Orange was more like a future dystopia. And I was going to bring up another future dystopia we watched recently that was ultra-violent that came out the same year as American Psycho, which was Battle Royale. But I do find it interesting that, the, in a way, this is not really a dystopia so much, but like you said, a post-apocalyptic. But it sort of, it kind of fits that chronology in a way. So it was an interesting pairing in that respect. <laughs> like the world was yeah. destroyed yeah. and it was just coming back yeah. to civilization. Well, again, I, I like the I like you bring up the dark tower. I like the phrase in the dark tower: "The world has moved on." I think that's appropriate for this. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to chill the girl yeah. in the dark tower came. <laughs> yeah, and, and I will say this: uh, this film has some charm with it, and Bloodlust, I feel like, uh, kind of modernized that, which was interesting yeah. because it it did the animation was slicker. It felt like mm -hmm. it was a 90... I mean, like I said, they were products of their time. So I do find this yeah. enjoyable because of the uh, because of the 80s aesthetic. Well, yeah. Well and, and, well, and you're talking about products of their time. One thing that sets them apart, and I know Brandon will appreciate this point, because uh, he and I so often debate uh, the merits of the English versus the Japanese dub. Um, but, um, but the... the but, um, that one, the 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 uh, bloodlust, um, famously produced American and Japanese dubs simultaneously. Oh yeah, and you could say either one is basically the original one. Although I I hew to the Japanese just because they had an all star cast, and I don't think they gave it quite that deference with the American one. Um, but this one, on the other hand, was an 80s dub that was redubbed by Streamline. They're not exactly known for their top quality redubs. But There's then some it's... charm to that, though. For yeah, sure. and, and this one was not bad. I don't think it was bad. Yeah. I'd like to hear the Sentai dub and hear if it's dramatically different or not. Um, but yeah, Sentai did redub it when they got hold of it. Um, but yeah, I just find that you're right. Like in terms of it being a, like a product of its time, the dub histories of the two alone kind of show that, but you're right as well. Bloodlust was a little slicker looking. This one well, definitely shows its age. Oh Again, yeah. I'd, I'd like to see the Sentai one. I'd like to see the Sentai release to see how much they cleaned it up. I, I I think one day I'll I'll give that a go and see. Here, there's here. some some color correction needs to be done at different scenes of it. I noticed watching it this time. Like there's oh, yeah. there's a couple times too where the lighting of scenes just seems to change willy nilly. Like when he's <laughs> fighting that bat dude and there's like the bat dude yeah. jumps backwards and it's all super lit up and then all of a sudden there's a scene like a couple of frames later where. It's the same background, but all of a sudden way darker, you know, so to making it more consistent. If ever there was an anime that needed to be darkened up and in some spots, oh, yeah. it's D. And that could be some nostalgia I have, like I said at the beginning, for mm. watching it straight boot quality on like some crap VHS tapes. But mm. uh, okay. the movie, in my opinion, looks better, a little darker, a little grainier. What did you uh, think of the uh, sisters that they that he ran into when trying to rescue the girl? The snakes cool concept, lame tits. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. whack fucking anime tits, um, dude. And I've seen plenty from this time period, as have we all. They I could do thinking, a lot better, you know. Uh, I was thinking back to Greek mythology with them because yeah, uh, they. 
uh, uh, obviously might be considered the three women who uh, were prophetic and they had uh, they held the uh, the lines of the souls of everyone from the underworld mm. um, and uh, oftentimes they were uh, they were possible uh, 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 possibly related to uh, uh, Medusa a little bit yeah I got oh, some of that yeah. vibe uh, definitely I like that part where she laughs after she's got them like wrapped up and it just echoes like in loops that's one of those moments one of several moments in the movie where if you're you were on a bunch of weed when you saw it like I was <laughs> you, you're going to pause for a moment and be like, wait a minute, did someone lace this? <laughs> well, I, I think feel, they are. I feel supposed like I'm on to, harder drugs all of a sudden. You know? I kind of feel like they are supposed to represent the Gorgon sisters. And the, um, the Sentai dub apparently does credit them as Medusa, whereas according to ANN, they've got the others listed as Greco Girl 1, 2, and 3. Uh, they apparently were voiced by different people in the streamline, but one person in the Sentai. Fucking so, Jake over here. If you love the Sentai dub so much, why don't you marry it? Then? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I thought you were all about some Sentai. I am. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, well, again, you know, I'm just looking. They, 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 no, that's no, no, one of the weird things cool is you... Know. It's one of the weird things when you look at the the way they're credited in different ones. Sometimes it's very different. <laughs> well, well so you, you know, with dubs, dubs is a fun part of anime, and I'm sure yeah. that any of you guys listening to this should probably seek out every dub that exists mm-hmm. to this movie and watch the different ones and find out which one you like Ooh. yourself the best. Okay, the, I, got, uh, I gotta look at this. I think that's... And the 80s dubs are a mixed bag. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, they're, they're and pretty much the... going to run the spectrum from decent, which is like the top of the list most of the time. I don't know oh, if usually, I've ever heard yeah. a fantastic '80s dub. They just didn't take the shit mm-hmm. seriously enough back then. Uh, I don't think they thought that these would uh, make uh, make a whole lot of difference. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I, dude. I mean, that's what I'm getting at. Like the spectrum mm-hmm. of '80s dubs. I, I'm mm-hmm. sorry, I cut you off, Brandon. I'll hand it back to you in a moment. But no, in just, my experience, yeah. the spectrum of '80s dubs runs from ass, like pure ass, to decent. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Akira would be a good. Uh, there uh-huh. is the exception for sure. Maybe Ghost in the Shell. Well, no, that's nineties. Is that nineties? Yep, yep. So, okay, but here an example though of where those who like to go for the original Japanese dub have very, very, very good uh, backing for their claim. We'll take as example D's hand. Is played by Ichiro Nagai. He's a, a, a veteran stalwart actor. And among his credits, Karin Sama from Dragon Ball, uh, Cherry from Urusayatsura, and Haposai from uh, Ranma and Half. I like that, just makes even more. Oh yeah, I mean the description I had of what caused the curse. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll guarantee yeah. the Japanese dub of this movie too makes it like way more epic, you know, because uh, it just has it has a way of doing that, you know. Like right. native Japanese is always going to sound better, I think, like o- overlapping the stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. There's just you know with dubs, you just got to play around with it. I'm not one of those people that like sticks hard to the I'll only listen to the Japanese dub shit because mm-hmm. I feel like if it's a dub by you know somebody like Funimation, I'll at least give it a shot. And um, our female protagonist is voiced by Michie Tomizawa, who voiced Rei Hino, aka Sailor Mars, in the original Sailor Moon. Okay. And she also voiced, uh, what was the other notable one I just saw here? 
a lot of little roles, but we were just talking about Kimigori Orange Road. She plays Manami Kasuga in that one. So, good times there. But, mm-hmm. So you have Happle-Sai and Sailor Mars among the cast. <laughs> uh, it's a wonder they got along. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> and uh, you've got some amazing talent in any of these cases. Mm-hmm. I've heard, I've seen the movie enough times to have seen it. And the only one I haven't seen is the Sentai dub, uh, obviously, but uh, yeah, it's because I don't own it. <laughs> well, I feel like, again, this is the, the dub that I remember. It, it has been a few right. years since I've watched and Vampire I Hunter. Will, I will concede, I'm not holding out much hope, unfortunately. I'm holding out very little hope, in fact, that we will get to watch Ron Mo and Half uh, Ni Hao, <laughs> my concubine, for our Martial Arts Mayhem Month. <clears throat> but the dub from that one, Brandon did show me. I remember he had a couple of sound bites that he particularly loved that I think came from that movie. Wasn't um, uh, Genma's comment about those cursed octopi from that one? <laughs> oh, yeah, cursed. <laughs> so that one did have a delightful dub. I'll give it that. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I, I thought that they did pretty. Other than changing Ranma's voice halfway through, I thought that that series had a good dub overall. Some right. strong, some strong voice acting, especially the one that played Genma in that one. But uh, well, I mean, it's dude. The dubs too. The American ones can like again. You know, the other half of that spectrum is ass. And being somebody who just received the original Dragon Ball movie pack in the mail. Mm-hmm. Watched a couple of those drunk oh, the other God. night. <laughs> Holy shit, <laughs> those dubs bad. Well, Actually, drinking makes the... it better. No, if it didn't, bro. It, it just didn't, sucked uh... all the way. <laughs> oh, wow. If you watch the dub for the Ursa Yatsura uh, movie, uh, what was it? The Beautiful Dreamer. Because mm-hmm. that was the only one that had an English dub, and it was, it was terrifying. I'm usually very tolerant for that. <laughs> Terrifying. But it really it, was super. It is. It was one of the first dubs I've ever seen. <laughs> and the dude, I put those, uh, especially that Curse of the Blood Rubies, the uh, Dragon Ball movie. Holy fucking shit. I was sitting here. I was wasted, so it should have been like, bit, like the better. First you know? Dub I ever. Uh, uh, and I was embarrassed for everyone involved, <laughs> including myself, for having sat there for like 40 minutes of the damn thing. The first dub of any anime that I ever saw was Unico in the Island of Magic. Hmm. So, um, it's not so bad, though. Well, the first dub I ever saw was the first anime I ever saw, which was Superbook. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, right there. Yeah. Uh, I mean,. I like. I think that some of the early child's cartoons weren't yeah. bad dub wise. Voltron, yeah. Robotech. Oh, Voltron uh, had Sven. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, then see, th- this one falls somewhere yeah. solidly middle of the road. You know, right. like it's serviceable, like you said, Jake, but it doesn't have enough camp like funny moments to make it great. In terms of like that criteria, you know, it's not an awesome, like cheesy old anime dub, but it's not bad either. You know, it's just yeah. kind of there. It, it works. Right. <laughs> it works. Well, in any case, did we touch on the final battle at all? We didn't, but I will touch on that the voice of the hand is the best voice in the movie, I think. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, yeah, the final battle was pretty awesome. I mean, you've got, uh, basically, they go ahead and uh, they try to get to that point. I mean, D goes in, he fights a snake woman, he takes him out, and he rescues the girl. He brings her back, and meanwhile, uh, the mutant guy is really PO'd about things, but he's kind of also scared that since he failed his boss, he's going to get... Uh, you know, something like his hand chopped off or something like that. You never know. Uh-huh, and uh, yeah. and then uh, his boss is like, nah, dude, you're good. Just uh, take this candle that, that nullifies vampire powers and you can 
kick his ass and that'll make up for it. And, and he inexplicably calls it incense at first for some reason. You guys so, catch yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, that's a bad translation right there. Um, but uh, of course, our blonde, uh, our blonde hero, uh, uh, he 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 decides he's going to do the whole switcheroo, which doesn't work out very well for the mutant fight uh, uh, against D, as he realizes, oh, this isn't good, and uh, he, so he gives D a hand. And uh, but D is uh, taken out later on through the fight uh, because of all because of other other issues that come up, which allows them to take the girl. Now, this is one cool one as well, because he gets his revenge on D later on with this candle. Oh, yeah, because he's able to get the candle back after the doctor turns out to try and (laughs) hijack him. And that yeah. hand the sweetest booby funny. snatch ever in movie history, right there, the where he's like, "Snatch that crucifix and your titty." The dandel- oh, you gotta love it, and the shower scene too afterwards. <laughs> All right, your backside, and the most awkward vamp gasm in history. Uh, we'll we'll get there though. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they they actually he ends up coming in and trying to basically while she's back there and they're fighting uh the doctor's like hey l- let's get you someplace safe turns out he's taking him to the lord's i mean to the uh, vampire lord's castle but uh vamp's daughter ain't having that crap she she's like no screw this crap i ain't having no peasant being my new stepmother so she's like no 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 we're gonna take you and put you someplace safe but uh Mutant guy has other plans, and so does blonde guy, who uh, ends up uh, using the candle to screw with them. Yep. But yeah, little Dan blows his ass off the fucking cliff. I love that part. <laughs> so but, uh, I like how uh, how a- after uh, the, the doctor guy f- uh, falls, he's like uh, uh, he he redeems himself by saying, "Don't think of me in that way." Does he though? <laughs> I mean, he snatched that titty like it was second nature. Okay. Hey, uh, that's uh, that's the human thing uh, uh, that any man would uh, do on any. Dude, I rewound that part and watched it like five times when I was watching this because it just made me laugh so fucking hard for some reason. That and also when little Dan gets tossed later, but okay. like he tries to hit the Dracula dude with the pipe and he just yeah like, flung no, down the guy. <laughs> Lucky for him, someone was there to catch him. <laughs> yeah, it didn't seem like it was going to be the case, dude, because he's just yeah. falling for so long. Uh, yeah. He took the same route that Luke's hand took in Empire right there. Like, he just... <laughs> down the chute. Um, That's impossible. <laughs> yeah, he does manage to finally get the revenge for the hand because he gets he finally gets the candle he was intended to get. But yeah, the hand gets his moment of glory uh, when D is like nearly. It does. Uh, <laughs> and of course, no. Continue, Brandon. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. The, you. the hand ends up waking uh, waking uh, uh, D up, and then uh, uh, and then uh, I kind I, I kind of had a, mo- a moment of thinking uh, that uh, that the, once the hand start uh, started moving again towards his body, uh, I was like, oh, there's thing. <laughs> from yeah. uh, Adam's family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a thing moment, so. Well, but, then you, you gotta wonder, too, if it kind of did inform other things maybe later. I don't know. Stuff like Idle Hands, yeah. or... I don't know. I mean, I would, <laughs> I would hope some of those nerds were watching stuff like this as they were making their movies that prominently featured hands with a mind of their own. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Well, oh, there yeah. is that short film in Quicksilver Highway where the hands end up uh, starting a revolution. So, a great one there. I enjoyed that, and I enjoyed <laughs> the original material it was based off of. We we'll have to do that one day. <laughs> but yeah, it was. I think that uh, as far as it goes, that was a pretty cool interaction because you got to see the guy's revenge. You got to play out the candle. 
And of course, all of this results in girl finally being delivered to the count for the wedding. And then you get to the confrontation after, of course, the scene that we talked about where the guy's like, okay, well, you ain't gonna make me a vampire. Well, screw that. I got this candle. I'm the boss now. Uh, you're the bitch. And then uh, he ends up uh, finding out, no, he's actually still a bitch. And uh, that. Uh... <laughs> well, there's, there's like artistic. I mean, the more I'm thinking about it, dude, and you, you, you saw the video not that long ago, Brandon. Uh, the, I think it's my second DBZ movie review for World Strongest there, uh, yeah. where Piccolo is like overcome by the, you know, those dudes like brainwashing them basically. Uh, I did enjoy that. That whole scene looks a lot like that scene in Vampire Hunter D where he's using the candle on him and he's like, you know, like freaking out. It's basically the same scene if you look at the two side by side. Well, it's like you said before, it almost looks like the the daughter is like orgasming as she's... uh... (laughs) Oh, the vampgasm? Yeah, that that whole part was... (laughs) <laughs> uncomfortable. I tried to snap a screenshot of it when I was watching it because I was going to share it in the chat. Like, damn, boys, this got weird. He uh, he got excited pretty quickly, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Something was getting stiff, some teeth and something else. <laughs> but, in any case. Uh, so, any case. after that, th- uh, then we have the final battle uh, where um uh, we have I think we're glossing over Ray's or what is this Ray that dude the mutant dude it's... his death scene though when yeah. he tries to confront the friggin count well yeah, and we already said he gets owned oh we did but I mean yeah. have we really given that it's it's you know that is a pretty good ownership you know uh, dude I mean, he <laughs> plays ping pong with him off of the, the yeah. entire shit and then he explodes his head scanner style i mean it's <laughs> definitely yeah. worth and, a mention and and then his magical what, uh, whatever powers that be vampire wise just stick, uh, just plant him on, uh, above the doorway at the end of the the mm-hmm. skyway thing or the bridge that uh, that uh, they were on, and uh, he's basically mm-hmm. owned. He's like, "You're my bitch." And you do when he blows up his head. I mean, all of that, like the, how unceremoniously he just fucked that guy up. That had yeah. been like a main focus of the movie up to that point was just awesome. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know that's something you don't see in anime these days. Somebody blowing somebody's head up. You know, you don't see that uh, as it's much. A, but it happened a lot back oh, then, right, guys? I mean, it definitely. Oh, yeah. You stop yeah. it. One of these days, I'm gonna just like strap you down here with like in one of those clockwork orange chairs and just make you watch fucked up things. But it heads exploded a lot in anime. I feel like in the 80s, yeah, at least yeah. the stuff we were getting over here and Fist of the North Star being one of those main oh. ones. Where they oh, were... this Some of them the bother me more than like seeing it in actual movies too. This, I don't know this the is anime that stuff. Actual... Is... Good. I said this was that actual line I was thinking of. What a wonderful night this has been. For the first time in 100 years, I haven't been bored once. <laughs> yeah. And it leads yeah. into a very good. It leads into a very cool battle between him and D. Yeah. And you think to yourself because D has been holding back the entire time. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you see a tinge of it in the snake battle. Because he's yeah. just kind of like sitting there letting them have their way with him. And he's just like barely affected by their energy drain at all. Which is great. Uh, the, the, he's just like, oh, no, y- y'all don't got nothing on me. Y- mm-hmm. You are... He just basically just slaughters them. The same thing happens with the vampires. Like, uh, you, you realize who I am, right? And uh, he sees that picture and realizes, crap. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, there's been that whole undercurrent too the whole time. Uh, I, I think they the hand kind of says it at one point that he's supposedly descended from Dracula oh. or whatever. But they, other than that, I don't think they really come out and talk about it too much. Mm. Well, yeah, and uh, that's the but you kind of know that it's a thing by that point, and so it's like this dude's definitely clearly like super saiyan compared to these other assholes. Uh, so he even tries to give him an out when they first confront him. He's like, just let's stop, not waste the time. Take me to the count, you know. Like, he's trying to avoid killing people, which is actually brought up, I think, by <laughs> Doris or whatever her name is later. Uh, it's them who want to fight, uh, fight, and they want to fight dirty, you know. It's it's them who who are instigating the uh, the uh, fights entirely but uh, by you know mm-hmm. not realize uh, well not realizing who the hell they are fighting first you know every opponent uh, 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 if you're going up against someone you do your research first you don't just yeah, out- to be fair ray or whatever did put his dick in the dirt like he kicked these ass you know? yes yeah. oh. And um, just a random tidbit I just saw here that's kind of fun. The the main dude, uh, Magnus Lee, is apparently a direct homage to Christopher Lee. Uh, so that's oh, kind of yeah. fun. And apparently yeah, they based, cool. yeah, they apparently based it more on the Hammer films than on the Stoker uh, lore. But yeah, so that's kind I of. I want to get that hammer collection yeah. that came out a while back. It looks really. It cool. Does look cool. The hammer just... films are ones. I mean, you got the you've got the universal ones, but the hammer films are also really cool. So honestly, the... so far of all the, I only own like six or eight of the sort of the classic monster hammer films, but I like them better than the universal ones. I don't know. Hmm. There's just something about them. The, like especially Dracula 1972 or whatever when he comes back and is like gone and biting girls at disco clubs and shit that's just fucking <laughs> awesome good times oh you know I mean they're a lot more modern in, in many ways um the uh the Hammer mm-hmm. films well yeah not I mean, taking anything away from Paris. Universal but Hammer kills for sure <laughs> but, uh, but hey, you know Christopher Lee is uh, is a great uh, was always a great Dracula, I think. Oh yeah, yeah, and you can see that in the design of Magnus or whatever. Like he's totally that classic Christopher Lee Dracula dude. Uh, he's a little bit heftier, but yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's it, thick is the preferred yeah. term nowadays, Jack. And he is a fine slice of man loaf right there, you know. He's fluffy. <laughs> Fluffy. I don't know that Fluffy is. <laughs> He's cool though. His mind powers are awesome. You know, again, that all scene there where like there's shades of all sorts of stuff in there. That catwalk they're on really reminds me of that first boss fight in Final mm-hmm. Fantasy VII. Now that I think mm-hmm. about it, which is a weird connection because I believe the dude who did like was the creator of this, and I think a Mon <laughs> Saga, if I'm correct. Also art. was the yeah. dude who did the art for Final Fantasy. Hmm. I can't. I'd have to look it up, but yeah, the art style is very similar. And uh, I remember watching. And there's a um, there's a Netflix show. And oddly enough, I tend to tend to be more for the physical media than uh, than the well, you know, than the uh, streaming media. But I have to say, they, uh, there is a show about the video games, they call it High Score, and they go I've into that. Things. And they talk about this, the artist basically had said that he did all of the art to design the monsters in the first Final Fantasy, and most of the games have been trying to work towards living up to his art style being uh, translated into life. And you can see as they go further and further down the line they get closer to the actual drawings that yeah, did. they do yeah they do a fair job of translating that oh, weird man. flowing like pointy art style that he has onto the monsters and stuff that you that you miss with later on i uh, thought that was interesting though i mean obviously it's a cool connection and i think it's weird that but maybe not coincidental that that catwalk that they're on in that final battle 
looks a lot like that catwalk that they're on in Final Fantasy VII when you fight the first like actual boss of the game. Um, oh, yeah. And it just, you know, like, the fact that there's that whole sort of Star Wars thing going on, too, with that long chamber underneath them. I mean, they make that explicitly clear with that kid flinging him down there. It's impossible sort of not to think back on, like, a little bit of Empire Strikes Back, I think, when you're watching that. Like, oh, he's <laughs> look at him just falling down the fucking tube. I think my favorite period of anime is the 80s and 90s anime. I mean, I'm watching a 70s anime right now, which is a Cap- one of the early Captain Harlock series. Oh, and nice. I'm like, this is okay. This is decent. But a lot of the 70s stuff is more of the stuff that I grew up that, with that were like the child shows that I didn't realize were anime. And oh, this like Speed was Racer and stuff, crap. You know, this is the stuff that you were like, oh, wow, animation can be for adults. This is just that, that, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would say that this is more <clears throat> of an adult, uh, adult uh, animation. Um, I mean... Uh, maybe teenager kind of thing because thing, uh, uh, to me I guess it depends on how you brought uh, brought, uh, brought up um, if you were brought up a certain way you might not see this till you're 13 14 15 you know um, but uh, there is a level of blood in this uh, f- uh, film that oh, yeah you could definitely see a younger child having nightmares because of it. I mean, I don't know, man. I mean, I was straight up brought up as like a little horror you know. fan. My parents never really put a governor on that, and they introduced me to the shit accidentally when I was a little, little tiny <laughs> toddler. Uh, right. So uh, definitely, stuff like this kind of fit right in. By the mm-hmm. time I saw it, it wasn't. That I mean, it was shocking because it was animated, and I hadn't seen like animated shit do that, you know. Right. Uh, but it wasn't oh, yeah. too insane. I mean, I'd seen scanners by the time I saw this, so that you know, <laughs> that head explosion was like, oh wow, didn't expect oh. that, you know, like in a cartoon. But that's pretty insane, you know. We experimented with it in the '60s. I mean, look at Wizards as a good example. Yeah. But. It's, uh, you know, or I think even in the 80s, uh, was it the 80s? Was that uh, heavy metal or was that 90s? I that was, uh, it was heavy 80s. metal was the 80s. The original. But, uh, you know, as, uh, as far as that goes, let's, let's see about production value. Uh, what did y'all think of the animation levels in this film? Yeah. Well, well the, 80s. the production value, there were some colors, um, that were used in there that kind of reminded me of uh, of a half animation, half live action mm-hmm. movie called The Phantom Tollbooth. Mm. Ah, yes. Um, mm. it, it, like some of the colors that that orchestrator uh, used in his sky scene kind of reminded me of some of the sky scenes in this particular fi- uh, film. I don't know why I jumped to that conclusion, but that's... Oh, well, did you see what I just did there? Anyways. <laughs> um, uh, but anyways, uh, the uh, orchestrator had the... Uh, the, the uh, he, there was the scene where uh, he conducted the sky. And <laughs> it went all kinds of myriads of colors. And, oh, uh, and, oh, I know the scene you're talking about in D. Just yeah. based on that. Yeah. So. Also, so long as you're not killing time, that's the most dangerous. <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah, uh, the um the the color quality control generally with the um, colors and and what have you is moderate. I mean, it was obviously fast not a t- and loose. Bro. It was obviously it was not a top budgeted anime. Um, there was there were- several teams of people animating this like in between coffee breaks. Hit. <laughs> Yeah, I I think this one it kind of to me it reminded me of like it was a it was a step or two up from the Bakshi films we recently watched in terms of the animation. 
mm-hmm. but not on the same level of, say, a Don Bluth or a Disney film by any stretch of the imagination. And yet the art uh, director <laughs> yeah. was, in fact, um, uh, he, he was in some of the backup uh, art for Aladdin the series and Return of Jafar. So, ah, Aladdin the series, which Disney will never let see the light of day. <laughs> ah, good jerks. <laughs> Asshole. What about uh, mm-hmm. what about the music uh, that? We well, have? you know, for a moment, uh, the, the, I didn't really get to weigh in on the whole. You know, oh, sorry. General Go for it. Yeah. It. Again, I would echo what I said earlier. Like, it definitely has you know that classic '80s shit. Like, the, this is that classic '80s shit. So, of course, it's got it like boiled down to a T right there for you. Um, definitely, you know, in terms of the like Jake was touching on, the quality control of this thing is abysmal when you really are watching it in terms of you know animation. Uh, it definitely lacks in terms of that because the, you know there's total lighting light you know the lighting doesn't fucking match in some of the scenes and it mm-hmm. drives me goddamn nuts you know <laughs> like that that's part of the reason why I like watching an old booted VHS of it is somewhat better in my mind because it's more of just a general everything's kind of dark uh when you watch it where it's clear and you can see those cuts like that, it's like, oh, what the hell happened right there? <laughs> Someone just called in sick to work and they were like, just whatever you get out of the afternoon, bro. <laughs> like, I don't understand how that happened. We had a modern day Picasso on the job that night. That okay. stuff aside, though, art style remains consistent through the entire thing. Uh, it's paced very well, you know, and all the animations, I think, aren't drawn out there a lot of it gets right to the point there's high action in the, in the way that the the scenes flow and stuff like that um i don't oh, know yeah. man I, I think though when you're really like weighing it against other stuff that was contemporary at the time it's still kind of weak yeah. vampire hunter d the theme and like how awesome it is and the gore and stuff like that makes up for a lot of the areas where it's probably lacking like there's a part where he launches off the goddamn horse through the drawbridge where every time i've wa- ever watched the movie it's just like it makes me cringe laugh like oh god you know like mm-hmm. it's just so fucking oh lazy. oh you mean that thing where he somehow he seems to be going forward toward the drawbridge and he seems to be going a little and higher just and like, it's like and he fucking somehow like yeah. fucking floats in the door. It's fucking stupid. Yeah, it's just so lazy compared to other scenes in the movie. And and then you can see scenes where it's like whoever animated this gave one tenth of the shit of the dude that animated the next scene. Like there's the part where the guy throws the fucking the bomb down next to him and he runs over mm-hmm. and he like cloaks himself. The all those frames where he like cloaks himself. And the bomb explodes look awesome. The rest of the movie around it, like noticeably, looks like shit compared to it. You know. Well, now the whole dra- now the whole fight that he had with uh, the count though at the end that was very well animated. Oh, for sure. Because I mean, they're not going to skimp on that. Uh, but there's definitely I'd call this like you know this is this definitely is like a low budget movie in terms of like anime feature films. You know. Oh, yeah. I agree. Um, there are spots that are kind of blotchy. Like I said, as I said the original entrance of the, of the horse was uh, like you were, uh, it was like you were seeing like, uh, okay, a Sequoia National Park version of a cow. <laughs> well, he's a horse. I don't know if it was course. that fat, but it was a fat fucking that was horse. a fat ass horse. I, I mean, <laughs> just like, it was a fat ass illumination of Vampire Hunter D as he sat on the horse. I mean, it, it was like, wait a minute, I I know this dude is a little bit more slimmer than that. You know, is it oh, just but, me uh, too, or in the in the the like opening scenes of the movie? Does it look like there's a girl riding on the back of the horse? Like it always takes mm-hmm. me a moment when I watch this to register that no, that's like his hair flowing back and forth. 
Oh yeah, they but like the long flowing hair. <laughs> the way they animated it, it's like it looks like it's coming from a separate head. You know? Well, may, and maybe that this was pre emptying the ring girl on the back of that horse. <laughs> no, I mean, okay, don't get me wrong, too. I'm not trying to take away from the overall quality of the movie at all when I say this stuff. I, I'm saying this in, in the purest, like, sense of admiration. I love this movie. It's just it definitely is, like, the Beastmaster compared to Conan kind of thing, you know, where it is a little bit cheaper than other anime movies that came out at the time. You know, oh, yeah. am I wrong? Uh, I can uh, see that. All righty, oh, yeah. favorite scenes. Um, oh, uh, oh, did we check with the music real quick? Uh, just to hit that. Sorry, I think I interrupted that. Well, the music, like I said, as said earlier on, um, it reminded me of Castlevania, uh, the game. Yes. Um, as far uh, as far as the music went, so I think that. Castlevania. I'm not sure. Either. Was the game out uh, before this movie or after? Oh, it would have been before. Again, mid '80s, late '80s. I'll check right now. I slacked on doing it before we did the call, and I should have just done it. Um, this movie came out when? Uh, 1985. Castlevania. Uh, looks like 86 is Castlevania, so no, it didn't precede mm-hmm. this. Oh, Castlevania go. came out in September of 1986 in so Japan. This may well have influenced it. Yeah. It had to. Uh, it had... The whip shit. I don't know why. It reminded me of a working designs title, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, oh, the video games? Oh, yeah. Like that little pink logo? Yeah. I know what you're talking about. That's that's what I was... I don't know why I'm thinking working designs, but it just uh, for some reason... Like that, that main... D's uh, main theme where it's like... Da, 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 you know, I can't think of the, the whole of it. But yeah, his main theme kind of reminded me of a working designs uh, type thing. Of course, I listen to the well, I've listened to the soundtrack of Lunar so often that maybe it's that. <laughs> See, Lunar is still one of the, one like duology, I guess you could call it that I still gotta fuck with. I missed those back in the day. I was so focused on SquareSoft and everything that they were booting out that I, I still feel like I missed out on Lunar. Too much a coincidence in, in the music of this uh, uh, and. Castlevania's music. Uh, oh, it for sure influenced Castlevania them. Three, which is the one that I'm used uh, to. <laughs> hey, Jake, you always like concentrate on the uh, on the opener and ender themes. I think there was an end. There uh, was song. an end that seemed kind of incongruous with the film, but you know, whatever. It was not bad. Oh, where it starts off and he's like wandering off on the horse. Yeah, it did feel like an well, anime. Well, well, when the an- well, the animation ended, and then there was that really poppy ender. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Yeah. Well, that was the thing I was going to ask because I know you usually pay more attention to the uh, J-pop that comes at the end than most of us do. So, uh, so I know you heard it all the way through. Yeah, I did. And um, you know what we need is American Psycho rescored with J pop. <laughs> hey, well, that'd be interesting. It would be. Uh, 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 so since we skipped over favorite scenes, let us uh, uh, do uh, uh, do our favorite scenes, and then we shall uh, end our, our wrap ups. Do our wrap up. Uh, 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 who has? Uh, who wants to start, Jake? Did you have a favorite scene from this particular film? Um, I don't know that I had a strong favorite. Um, you don't care for this film all that uh, all that well, do you? Well, I don't dislike it. Um, it, I guess, maybe that 
I, maybe a couple of scenes where the hand is talking and doing his thing because he was amusing. <laughs> um, that's probably the main one that stands out to me. Okay. Uh, yeah. What about Steve Brandon? Um, oh, I love the confrontation uh, on the wagon. Um, when you have the doctor revealing his true colors, uh, the whole candle confrontation, and of course, knocking the blonde guy off the cliff. That was just great. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I absolutely love that part, dude, where little Dan shoots him off. He just, bam! Like, it's so <laughs> unceremonious, and he just says, ah! <laughs> I could not stop laughing. I I liked the vampgasm section a little bit. I uh, you did. For, for, for some reason, I I didn't mind it, even though I uh, 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 once you named that piece or section as the vampire, <laughs> thing that I had to chuckle a little bit. Um, yeah, it is what it, 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 <laughs> how, how can you call it anything else, you know? <laughs> but um, I, 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 I too liked the confrontation uh, in the wagon, but um, I also uh, liked the um, fact that um, uh, Ray um it, 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 I, I like the moment where Ray actually saved the kid um, for, uh, it, it, from falling. Mm-hmm. Um, for some reason, I, I felt like for a moment, like he was going to be a good guy. But, uh, but uh, and he, I guess in a sense, he kind of did because he went up against his master. But he still ended up getting owned. And I think I like that part, too. Well, he wasn't he wasn't a good guy, but he was out for his own ends and uh I think he would have betrayed the count eventually. He just uh wanted the count's help to, you know well be stack. his own yeah, he wanted to be his own vampire like uh he wanted to be a vampire lord himself. Uh he got he was ahead trying of trying to be noble too. Yep. Um anyone else? Uh I'll go, I guess. Uh, definitely that opening scene where, she, you know, uh, what's her name? Doris is like <laughs> running through the the blackness there and she's hunting down that mutant and then it ends up getting her like that whole opening scene of Vampire Hunter D is the thing that sold me on it because you got that sort of like rugged feature vibe going on with her rifle but then the settings and then you got that like sort of boiling 80s fucking anime gore already present right there with the way the bullets affect that mutant that she's shooting at yeah it gets like crazy right away with you know that thing biting her horse and lifting it up in the air and then you see that vampire like that whole opening sequence of the movie just kills uh after that probably the whole sequence of him storming the castle initially because it's got that video game vibe and he sees all those like 80s anime horrors in there Uh, and then definitely ray's death or whatever where he gets pinballed off of all that shit and then his head explodes like (laughs) <laughs> such a good payoff such an unceremonious death for a, a lead character so it almost kind of leaves you thinking that D might end up dying you know Yeah. because they built this other character so much and he just gets fucking hamburgered you know oh yeah mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I guess that and then the, the resulting tension before the final battle is probably my favorite p- point of the movie Okay. Very cool. All right. On that note, I think uh, we'll do our outro. So, uh, well, I think Brandon had something he wanted to say there. Did, did what, you what you oh, no, you're good. Lake can go to the outros. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mo, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, you know, in the spirit of this being an anime discussion, instead of telling you anything about my boring self, I'm going to recommend an anime to you guys, and that is Diary of My Days at the Breakwater. 
should check it out. It's available on Funimation. They simulcast it or whatever, which is, I assume means that they broadcast it here at the same time as they did in Japan. Uh, so it's brand f- fucking spanking new. It's it's a, it's an anime about a girl who joins a fishing club. It's a whole hell of a lot of fun. You should check it out immediately. Basically, every episode is them fishing for awesome fish, and then they cook it up into something that looks delicious. So mm. be prepared to oh, yeah. get the munchies a lot while you're watching. <laughs> Good Far better than the less than awesome fish. <laughs> Check it out, boys. I'm going to be doing a little spoiler-free review here soon, which will give you a taste for it. And that's all I got. All right. Also, check out my Dragon Ball reviews. They're pretty tense. Oh. Can't wait <laughs> for the next part. That's going to be fun. And that's Mo from... Oh, Yamcha rules. And that's Mo from Junkin' Master Studios. So let's go over to you, Brandon. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Well, I'm Septim Sen of Septim Sen versus the World. We do various things on the channel, but most of it focuses on physical media, uh, pickups, new release news, you know, that sort of that sort of stuff. Occasional reviews, a um, couple of cool things that have been going on for the channel for this uh, for the season. Uh, one thing that I have had going on that is surprisingly popular is uh my costume quest playthrough i've been uh, <laughs> posting a uh, uh i've been posting a part of that every week on fridays and it's been pulling consistently about 200 views per uh and very quickly so i don't know what that is but people got their costume quest uh fix on so hey well, what do you want um and uh, Mondays, we are bringing back our Halloween <coughs> uh, focus, which is going to be extending beyond October because we are going to be dedicating ourselves to going through the entire Friday the Thirteenth catalog. If you were not, if you were not able to see the discussion that we did on Monday in relation to fan films even had a director of a fan film come on to uh, chat and uh, kind of like uh, hawk his own wares so so to speak so it was a very fun experience overall we talked about the uh, fan films um, legacy uh, vengeance and never hike alone but on top of that, we also uh, checked out the trailer for Voorhees, which is debuting at the end of this month. So we got a lot of cool stuff coming up. And next week on Monday, it's going to be Friday the 13th, part one and two. So you should join us there. <coughs> and of course, finally, for Inside Movies Galore news, uh, we are in the midst of our martial heart martial arts mayhem death matches right now uh all of the opponents have been chosen and now they're all duking it out in the various uh facebook groups if you are in a movie collectors um let's see here talk movies with us most tavern or uh anime collectors incorporate Animated Collectors, Inc. You, too, could participate in the fights to see who is going to go on to the final bracket to duke it out for the final discussions in November. (laughs) But but that's not all, because next week... Mortal Kombat! No. (laughs) That might be one of them. Oh, it is up for as a possibility, so you never know. Uh, Next week, we are going to be uh, taking a break from all the spooky stuff as it's Dane's birthday week, and we're going to be celebrating Dane's birthday. I don't know how much of a break. Barton Fink gets pretty darn dark. (laughs) Oh, Last Samurai, though? Yeah. Well, (laughs) some people would say Tom Cruise is kind of scary. 
But yeah, Last Samurai is the pre-show. <laughs> and uh, Barton Fink as the main show. So some fun stuff there. I think we're going to do good. But we will get one more Halloween... Uh, well, Halloween type jab in on the following week. So we will see you next week. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, what about you, Jake? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm Kotobuki Jake. I also co star on Septum Sim vs. the World. And um, I am a movie collector, fan, what have you. I like to do a lot more stuff, but I seldom have the time because of work gonna be so tired tomorrow (laughs) but um i think uh mo's got a fun little concept there and because i'm too tired to think of anything else right now i'll just loop back around at the start of our conversation where i mentioned uh the series kimaguri orange road for those of you who are not familiar with it this is a very high quality film uh, series from the 80s um let's see i think late 80s if i remember correctly uh-huh. um basically 87 to 88 for the anime and then there were two movies that came out later and several ovas uh the second movie is a whole different creature that kind of doesn't really matter all that much but the first one's nice (laughs) but basically it's a series um an old school love triangle styled romance uh between a young man whose family happens to have supernatural power and meanwhile he becomes friends with Hikaru and Madoka, and they're both very different and very interesting, and he likes them both a lot. And Madoka Ayokawa is one of the most kick-ass love interests in any anime ever. So it's a fun show, but I really like how they blend romance with the supernatural. But the supernatural's almost played off as a, eh, you know, it's not the focus. It's right. just kind of just there. Just there. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of fun. Um, and, of fun. course, the series was way out of print. But Discotech did us a solid, and now it's available in a much thinner package than before. He does <laughs> Galaxy 999 releases. Right. Oh, yeah, I want to get those. Nice. I just got to get the money, man. Yeah. They, they are, like, they're worth it, though. Like, he was well, fortunate. You know, these the guys old... definitely covered Never Hike Alone. But Jake definitely needs to hike along and make some nature videos because you've been teasing us with those for about a year now or something. Uh, uh-huh. yeah. I'm frankly getting a little, a little frustrated I was, over here. Bro. I, was planning, I was planning a field trip Saturday, but I don't know if it'll happen because things. But yeah. who knows? I just need to be around there so I can drag Jake out of his house and film him getting stung by a caterpillar or something for Brandon's amusement. Yeah. <laughs> there's that new, uh, there's that new invasive species of, of caterpillars <laughs> that look like, uh, that look like hair pieces. Uh, you could actually try and just pick some of those up with your bare hands. Oh, and, did you guys see the one that? To- did you guys see the one that I put on an ad that looked like a hair piece? Yeah, yep. that's yeah. no, I didn't see the uh, but it, okay. it's that's an invasive species that needs to be like uh, gone, but yeah, well, it's not the one I'm thinking of, but yeah, this <laughs> thing's this thing's wicked looking. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of discotech, uh, the animation that I want to put out there for everyone is uh, Lily Cats, uh, which mm. we spoke of, of uh, sometime during this podcast and. It is a combination between Alien and Predator uh, and a cat. So, um, uh, huh. able to the view on TV, if I remember it. In a 1980s uh, animation, that, that, uh, uh, it's one of the ones that scared the shit out of me when I, uh, when I was like 13, 14, and uh, it, it was on <laughs> sci fi. Um, 
and then I just completely forgot the title of it. But uh, I'm one of the founding fathers of Inside Moves of Galore. So thank you for coming along with our long uh, lily pad discussions here, um, where uh, I've, I've enjoyed every single discuss discussion that we have. And, uh, um, uh, I've grown accustomed to talking to you as my friends. So uh, uh, thank you yeah, for it's fun. joining I, us. I look forward to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining uh, joining uh, uh, us. And uh, but I also moonlight under a different channel called Delusions of Grandeur, where I upload videos of my own collection and uh, try to get out some of the views of my own of films that are out there. I may not be all fancy dancy and dandelion like the the uh, Beavis. Uh, looking character that we had in our animation discussion today, but <laughs> um, I certainly try to uh, try to at least give you uh, at least a fair uh, 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 a fair uh, uh, at least opinion of uh, what I thought of the films as I go along. So I happen to hold you in exactly the same category. <laughs> 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 Uh, thank you for listening. Have a great uh, day, evening, or morning, where, uh, whichever side of the globe you're, uh, you're waking up or falling out of bed for. Uh, just uh, stay tuned for some more exciting shit. You'll always be my dandelion. <laughs> <laughs>